I, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to give you a quick rundown about who I am, what I am, who we were, so that hopefully you can understand what I'm about to do. I'm going to help a wealthy corporation make an unimaginable amount of money by sacrificing the last of a unique species for your benefit. I need to tell you about myself first. My name is Finale. My grandmother's name was Bopsy, and my mother's name was Tick Tick. They called me Finale because they said there weren't going to be any more, that we were the last of our species, and if nature was fair, then I'd be the last one standing. They've both passed away, so I'm the last one. Now I'm going to help a wealthy corporation make an unimaginable amount of money by sacrificing me for your benefit. And it's going to be horrible for me. I won't see anything out of it, but I can't not do it. Anyway, I have to tell you who I am so you can understand that something good's about to be happening. My name is Finale. I was raised by my, my mother and my grandmother. We were very poor, which was normal. My grandfather died a long time ago. They said I didn't have a father. They used to tell me I was just born and that was all. That's what they always told me. I think that might be why I'm so comfortable not understanding anything. It's the way I was brought up. My grandmother used to have these jokes that she would repeat. She called them her ancient clown haikus. She would say things like, If I had a penny for every time someone farted, I'd be a billionaire. And that someone is you, Finale. Good night, my boy. We also had this thing where she would point to me and say, Is that a mask? And I was supposed to answer, Don't ask. It was our own little inside sing-song, call-and-answer, secret handshake. Is that a mask? Don't ask. I stopped answering her when I became a teenager. I wish I hadn't. When I was a kid, her and my mom used to put makeup on me to keep people from asking me if I were wearing makeup. When I wear makeup, they don't ask me that. That's why I still wear makeup. I'm not wearing makeup right now. This is what I look like. When I used to tell people that, they would ask me if I had a skin condition called vitiligo, and I'd say, sure. It was easier than telling them something that they weren't going to believe anyway. <laughs> sure, I have a skin condition. We all do. Now that's all I'm going to tell you about my childhood because I have a lot to tell you and we don't have much time. So I'm going to tell you something about me personally, about my personality. My name is Finale. I'm not very smart and I'm not very wise. But there were times when I have been clever in that I knew when to think fast and when to act slowly. My people have never been thought to be smart or wise, but we were always considered clever. I used to pretend, pretend I was smart to attract girls, but that was because I was drunk. <laughs> it was unwise. The following morning, my stupidity would come home to roost. I would greet the day with two cups of coffee over a remorseful review of my behavior. I don't spend my evenings that way anymore, so... My morning remorse is now based on a lifetime of experiences. Speaking of experiences, my grandma used to tell this really disgusting story as if it were real, but I think it was a joke. I'm pretty sure it was. She would say she was walking down the street and she passed this old homeless guy who was sitting on the sidewalk in a puddle of filth. His hands were filthy, his clothes were filthy, he had this big white beard that was matted from filth and the hair around his mouth was yellow and crusted with filth. As she walked past him, he said, Hey! She kept walking. Then he yelled out, Guess how old I am? So now she walks back to this guy and she says, Let me suck on your beard. So she gets down and she starts sucking on this guy's beard and it is the most disgusting experience that anyone could ever put themselves through. 
She said it tasted like sweat and filth and rotted chicken broth and old tuna water and tobacco. And the closer she got to his mouth, the more disgusting it became. As she's doing this, her neighbor walks by and he says, Bopsy! What the hell are you doing? My grandma says, I'm trying to guess this man's age. And her neighbor says, you can't guess a man's age by sucking on his beard. So my grandma says, now I know this from personal experience. <laughs> my mom used to hate that joke. I thought it was hilarious, especially when Bobsy told it. I brought that up because I was talking about experience, but my point is I am getting smarter with age. That's not something to brag about when you consider where I'm starting from. If I were really smart, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm about to do. You remember that story about the little Dutch boy who stuck his finger in the dike to keep his village from flooding and it worked? How long do you think he had to stand there? Do you think the people of his village kept bringing him food and clean pants, or do you think they got tired of listening to him complain? Maybe they cut off his finger and sent it home. It sent him home. There's no record, so how could we know? What was I talking about before all that? Getting drunk to attract girls. Is that right? Is that what I said? I hope not. <laughs> I drink because when I don't drink, everything becomes too obvious. It's like hunting for Easter eggs with a map showing the locations. I'm not in this to eat hard-boiled eggs. I'm in it for the adventure, for the fun and freedom to say, I don't know. How do you spell the number eight? I don't know. How was your summer? I forget. I was once called in for jury duty selection. They asked me if I knew what beyond a shadow of doubt meant. I answered them very honestly, so they let me leave. Knowing nothing gives me the freedom to think about things I know nothing about. The possibilities are endless. Knowing things is good too, as long as you can keep it in perspective. Let me tell you some of the things I've learned. It applies to who I am and what I am and what I'm about to do for you. Thying. Thym. Thylum plums. Thy thylacines. Thylacines. I need to tell you about thylacines first. It took me a while to remember that word. That was one of the words that the nurse taught me. She taught me a lot of things. A lot of the things I know, she taught me. She told me things about myself. I was interested in hearing those things. We all want to hear about ourselves. It makes us feel loved and special. And the fact that she was really my nurse made it more intimate. She was Nurse Jennifer later to be known as Jenny, now and forever to be known only as the nurse. She forfeited all first name privileges with that stunt that she pulled. I'll talk more about her later. So I need to tell you about thylacines before I could tell you about what I'm going to do for you. Thylacines is the science name for Tasmanian tiger wolves or Tasmanian tigers or Tasmanian wolves. They're all the same animal. They call them tigers because they had stripes on their butts. They call them wolves because they walk like wolves and look like wolves and growled and snarled and killed and acted exactly like wolves, but they had nothing to do with wolves. They were more closely related to kangaroos. They even carried their babies in pouches like kangaroos, but the opening was on the bottom. That way the babies could get in and out. I think that's interesting. So the way these things became like wolves is, the world evolved, and in this one spot there weren't any wolves, but there has to be wolves. So these animals became the wolves. The rest of the world was being balanced out by wolves, except for this place, so they got their own. They evolved to fit the function. That makes perfect sense that they would look and act like something else that was doing the exact same job. I, I just remembered the first time I met the nurse. I was strapped to the bed. She came in to change my IV bag. She was the first person there to talk to me instead of about me, or talk at me like I didn't understand anything. She was also very pretty. When she leaned over to unhook my tube, <laughs> I saw down her shirt. <laughs> Everyone wore scrubs, and suddenly I could see down this girl's shirt, and she had on a tiger-striped bra. It was like a ray of sunshine blasted into my room. I only brought that up because I was talking about tigers. I'll tell you more about the nurse later. But did you know that tigers are bigger than lions? I read that in a book called 
tigers are bigger. I made that up. But tigers actually are bigger than lions. The nurse told me that. I take a great deal of pleasure in knowing that Bopsy and Tick Tick would have hated her. So Tasmanian tiger wolves evolved to be exactly like wolves, even though they were a completely unrelated animal. I've made that point. Now let's talk about blood. What color is it? It is all the colors of the rainbow. Cockroaches have white blood. When the females have the eggs, it turns orange. Tuna cats have yellow blood. Leeches and some worms and one kind of lizard has green blood. There's a fish that has clear blood. And there's some things that have purple blood. Your blood is red because it uses iron. It has iron in it. They say royalty has blue blood. That's Bullshoot. Octopuses and scorpions and horseshoe crabs have blue blood. Their blood doesn't have iron in it. It uses copper instead. Mine has copper. All clown blood has copper. Not people who paint themselves up as a joke, but real clowns, genetic clowns. That's something we have to talk about. But first I want to tell you about horseshoe crabs. There were these guys who would wade out into the water to collect horseshoe crabs to cut up and sell as bait. Doctors found out that the blue blood of horseshoe crabs could kill diseases. It was a powerful antibiotic. So the guys who were selling horseshoe crabs as bait started selling horseshoe crabs to laboratories and they made a lot more money. The laboratories would bleed the horseshoe crabs for days and sell their blood as medicine and they made tons of money. The blue crab blood was very effective at killing diseases in red blood in people. So then the laboratories would give the horseshoe crabs back to the bait hunters to release into the wild. The shock of what they went through was going to kill most of them anyway, so the bait hunters would usually chop them up and sell them as bait. Most of the ones that got released didn't survive, and most of the ones that did couldn't reproduce. That's a very ugly story. But what these people did made a lot of money and saved a lot of people's lives. Now, imagine what my blood is worth. I'm considered human. But when push comes to shove, I am not considered human. I haven't been sick a day in my life. Nothing affects me. I don't even get bit by mosquitoes. Fleas don't even like me. I'm the walking cure-all. They say laughter's the best medicine. That's a good guess. So my name is Finale. They call me that because they knew I was going to be the last of our species, and they were right. I'm the last one. I want to tell you about clowns in a minute, but first I want to talk about the plague. It's killing so many people right now, and everyone's afraid. Actually, let's talk about clowns first. These are hard times, and I don't want to be the one talking about the plague or sad things or anything like that. My mom, Tick Tick, told me that after my grandpa's funeral, my grandma said that she thought we should dress all corpses up like Santa Claus for open casket funerals. That way, at Christmas, when people took their kids to see Santa, they would experience a sense of wonder and magic. <laughs> she made light of her darkest moments. Mom told me that that was part of our heritage. I think it might be the only part of our heritage. Other than that, we ate junk food and watched TV and did what everyone else was doing. So the nurse told me that the oldest sample of blood that they could find in fossils was blue. It had copper in it. It used copper to move oxygen. That's what the nurse told me. That means my blood is older than yours. We could probably guess that shortly after we started evolving, your people evolved everywhere, like the wolves did, while my people kept evolving in some dinky, faraway place. That was my grandfather's name, by the way, Dinky. And we all met up later. According to clown history, we've been involved with each other's lives since forever. My people haven't always been treated very well. In fact, we've been treated very poorly, but we've always been together. Hundreds of years ago, the rulers and the wealthy, people who had castles, would have these huge banquets. For entertainment, they would have fools parade around in the middle of their party. 
These were people with birth defects, people with deformities, and my people because of our skin colors. We would parade around for everyone's entertainment and people would chuck food at us. That was their entertainment and our pay. Now remember, we were very clever. We used our wits to change our situation. Not to take us out of the situation, that would have been smart. We weren't smart, so we changed the situation. We evolved socially. Maybe that was smart, I don't know. I don't know what the options were at that time. So in those places, we changed our social status. We changed it so people didn't just laugh at the way we looked, they laughed at what we said. That was huge. It got to the point where people laughed at anything we said. That meant we could say anything we wanted. We could insult the king and he would laugh. It was unheard of. If anyone else tried that, they would get killed. In those situations, we still weren't treated as equals and we weren't respected, but we had a type of respect that nobody else had. We used that. It had its own power. In some places, we were regarded as priests and holy men. Some Native American tribes thought we were sacred. The Lakota people called us the Hayoka. When you grow up as a clown, you learn about these things. The nurse didn't tell me that. My mom used to talk about that stuff all the time when she was drunk. Alcohol has the same effect on us as it does you. Or it seems to anyway. So what happened was we became entertainers, partly because we didn't have a place of our own, and it's something that families can do in traveling. People who didn't have money started painting them themselves up to look like us so they could make money doing what we were doing. Even prostitutes started painting themselves up to look like us because we didn't have any diseases and were a very attractive people. It didn't take long before people felt more comfortable watching people who were pretending to be clowns instead of wa laughing at people who they didn't really feel that comfortable laughing at in the first place, or at least not anymore. We started getting a bad reputation because some of the things that some of these fake clowns were doing. People are still afraid of us because of the fake clowns. The only thing we could do was paint ourselves to not look like clowns, so that's what we did. We blended in. I was able to make a living by painting myself up to look like a red-blooded citizen and telling jokes that I heard Bopsy say, it worked, it was fine. Until one night, I was at a nightclub, I was telling that joke about sucking on an old man's beard, and someone threw a bottle at me. It hit me in the hand and I started to bleed. It cut me pretty good. I had to get out of there while people were still thinking it was part of the joke. Someone from the audience saw that and knew what was going on. They took a sample of my blood from the stage and that was it. He knew what was going on and he had the tools to put all the pieces together because he was a scientist. Scientists go to comedy clubs too. So he had a lot of backing. He was able to find me, which wasn't hard because I had to keep working. I had to make a living. So he came up to me after one of my shows and made me an offer. He wanted to do some tests. What kind of tests? I asked. Standard tests. They won't have any effect on you. But what kind of test? I want you to answer some questions and possibly take a blood sample. We would just need a tiny drop of blood, a pinprick on the end of your finger. You'll be compensated for it. Could we do it without the blood sample? These are standard tests. People undergo these every day without any effects. But if there's anything that you don't feel comfortable with, we won't do it. What kind of compensation? That would depend on your participation. We could have you in and out within an afternoon, or if you felt comfortable, you could stay with us for an extended period. We would make it worth your while. This guy had spent his life studying clowns, and as far as he knew, he'd never seen one. He thought we were extinct, which isn't too far from the truth. If you are the last one, then you're pretty much dead already. So I said, all right. That was a big mistake. The scientist says, give me your address. I'll send a car tomorrow afternoon to pick you up. I give him my address. That night, an ambulance shows up in front of my apartment. I basically get arrested and taken to the hospital. They didn't want me to change my mind and not be there the next day, so they got me that night. I was now an endangered species, and this guy was going to protect me and study me and do tests and tell the results to other scientists, and he was going to try to preserve my species. 
I didn't know what that meant. Here's how you preserve a species. This really happened. There was a black rhino, and it was the last of its kind. It was the last one. There weren't going to be any more. Plants and bugs and small things go extinct every day and no one notices, but this was a rhinoceros, so people were going to notice. They had a boy rhino on their hands, so they decided to use him to impregnate other kinds of rhinos, but they couldn't count on him being attracted to these other rhinos. So they made a situation so that the rhino was comfortable enough for scientists to go in and harvest its seeds by hand. That's all I'm going to say about that. So they used the black rhino seeds to impregnate other rhinos to create knockoff half-breed species to keep the DNA going. It didn't matter if the species was dead as long as something was kept alive. It's all about the idea with these people. So weeks go by. I spent most of it strapped to a bed. Twice a day I get taken to physical therapy by a team of bouncers. I tried to be nice to those guys, I saw them every day. But they were paid to restrain me if necessary, and that was it. They weren't going to talk to me. The doctors never came in alone. They always came in as a team or with their students. They would talk about me like I couldn't hear them. And when they talked to me, it was like they were playing make-believe. If you've ever begged for money on the streets, you've seen this. People will either act like you're not there or pay you 25 cents so they can look you in the eye, but not as an equal. I know this because when I was trying to hide from these people, I had to live on the streets. I had nowhere to go. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So after about two days, I realized I was trapped. I was a prisoner. They weren't going to let me go. So I stopped answering their questions. I wasn't going to help them. Beyond that point, I was restrained, monitored, in, and pruned. They took blood, hair, fingernail clippings, saliva, urine, stool, and tissue samples. They wanted to preserve my species the way they did the black rhino, but I wasn't going to play ball. So I didn't talk to anyone for a couple of months, and no one talked to me. Then they give me a new nurse. She's young and pretty and she cares about the feelings of animals. She's kind. And when she leans over you, you can smell fresh air and sunshine from the outside on her skin. And she smiles at you when she takes your temperature with a digital forehead thermometer. She apologizes for bumping your tray. That means she's talking to you. You don't answer at first because you don't want her to get into any trouble. But one day she comes in and she tapes a picture of a kitten to your wall to cheer you up. It looked like she cut it out of a magazine, probably from the lobby, and you say thank you. When you see her tiger stripe bra, you don't say anything because you can't. And when she puts her hand on yours to change your tube, it feels like you're in love. Here's where you could tell I'm not too smart. No one questioned the kitten picture. The doctors and nurses and scientists and guards came and went without even looking up at it. The cleaning crew cleaned everything every day and they left it hanging there. It was part of the setup. I'm not that smart anyway, but after a couple of months living like that, your wits get frazzled. I should have seen it and I didn't. The nurse was a setup. Nurse Jennifer, soon to be known as Jenny, soon to be known as my Jenny, was a setup. Along with her nurse duties, she would stop by to check on me, just to stop by just to say hi. She started bringing me things and sneaking things in that I wasn't supposed to have. We started having secrets. It was all I had. If she didn't show up one day, I would feel like I was going to lose my mind. And then when she showed up again, I would feel like everything was fantastic. So one day, the doctor comes in. Jenny's sitting with me. We're just talking. And the doctor says I can leave. They bring in a bag with my clothes in it and tell me I can leave. My physical therapy bouncers are waiting behind them in the hall. They're going to walk me out. I say, what about my compensation? He says, there is none. He went into a lot more details, but basically there was no compensation. I don't have any money. I haven't been paid rent for months, which means I don't have an apartment. They know this. Nurse Jenny then asks if it would be all right if I stayed at her place. 
She put her hand on mine when she said it, right in front of everyone. The doctor said, that was up to us. He thanked me for my cooperation and left me with Jenny and the bouncers. That night, Jenny and me consummated our friendship in her apartment. After that, we were inseparable. She even took time off work just so we could be together. And we were together for months. I, I was crazy about her. Now here's what happened. She insisted I wore something for protection. Of course I would. I didn't care. That's because I didn't know she was keeping it and freezing it for the hospital. She was harvesting seeds. I didn't know. Maybe they got all they needed. I don't know what happened. But she started acting strange. She started telling me she loves me so much, and then she'd lock herself in the bathroom and cry. Sometimes she would ignore me and act annoyed if I tried to hold her hand or something. Then she would leave and not tell me where she was, and if I asked, she would act like I was accusing her of something. One morning I hear her crying in the bathroom. I have no idea what's going on, so I get up. She hears an ambulance pull up out front. She comes out of the bathroom and runs to the front door, pushes against it, and starts to tell me everything in a panic. She tells me about the seed collecting and that she was paid to do this, and now she's freaking out because they're going to take me back to the hospital. While she's saying all this, I'm watching an ambulance team rushing to the house across the street. They didn't come for me. The people across the street called for an ambulance because an old man had fallen down. The one that was coming for me wasn't there yet. I ran. I opened the door, pushed past her, stepped outside, and ran. I never heard my ambulance. I was probably crying too hard. I feel bad for anyone who had to see that. Now, no home, no money, no friends, no family. Heartbroken, betrayed by the one I loved and trusted. Make a list of 20 living hells, remove a couple, and that's where I was. When a kid gets lost, the best thing they could do is sit down and wait for someone to find them. That's what I did. I sat down on the sidewalk and cried my eyes out for two days without stopping. <laughs> this homeless kid named Richie sat down next to me and started begging. He put out a little box and put his head down so that people passing by might give him some money. Maybe he thought sitting next to a crying man might help his chances... Or maybe he thought I just needed some company. Anyway, I appreciated him sitting there. He had other young friends who would come and go. They were all runaways and drug addicts. Richie was too. The first thing I noticed about Richie was his gums. They looked like balloons. I know you're not supposed to share needles with junkies, and you're probably not supposed to share dental floss with them, but I did. It was an experiment. I flossed with a string from an old tea bag until my gums bled, then I talked Richie into using it. It totally worked. Some people might say it was because I got him to floss for the first time. But it was my blood that cured his gums, and his pink eye, and his drippy ear infection, and his drug-beaten bloody nostrils. He cleaned up to be a pretty good-looking kid. I spent a lot of time with Richie and the kids. I want to tell you more about them, but I don't have any more time. I have to tell you what I'm about to do. The plague. It's killing thousands of people every day. The only way to stop it is for me to help a wealthy corporation make an unimaginable amount of money by sacrificing the last one of a unique species for your benefit. I'm going to go back to the hospital now. I'm sure the nurse isn't there anymore. I know the doctor is. They're going to strap me to a bed and drain my blood and sell it to keep you safe. They're going to do it every day, and they're going to do everything they can to keep me alive for as long as they can. They're going to sell my blood and make a lot of money. <laughs> I'm giving it away for free. As far as being the last of my kind, when I'm gone... No one will ever see you the way I see you ever again. The way I see you is part of who you are, and when I'm gone, that part of you will die with me. So when all of you die, the way you, you see me will die too, and that's a big part of me. That's all there is. That's why I have to do what I have to do. All of us are the last of our kind. 
My name is Finale. My grandmother's name was Bobsy and my mother's name was Tick Tick. I'm not very smart. But I know what it feels like to be in love. <laughs>